my friends, this is an episode you really want to stick around for. Um, Maria Oberto, let's go. Yeah, all right, let, let's do this. Hey, what's up, everyone? Gazale Orel here with episode eight of the Go Local Live Q&A show, where I sit down with inspiring and empowering people from the ind indigenous rights scene. I still have a lot of trouble with pronouncing indigenous. I don't know why, though. But um, anyway, um, the, um, both past and present, um, so who were in the, in the scene or in the movement um, or that are still in the movement. Um, and they, these are people, um, yeah, Pretty, pretty much are where you want to go um, so you can learn from their experience, uh, learn how to, over, yeah, how to overcome or avoid mistakes and pains so you can do what inspires you faster. I think that that's the gist of this, um, yeah, th this, this show. And on this episode, I have a very good friend of mine, Maria, um, full disclosure, not full disclosure. Um, yeah, well, let's do full disclosure. I um, have interacted. I have not, we, we did not talk a lot actually at the UN, um, unfortunately. Um, Global Indigenous Youth Caucus, that's what, what, you, what you were primarily um, moving in. I was in the Global Caucus uh, a lot. Uh, we interacted mostly at Keats. Um, I don't know why though, but um, yeah, um, probably, yeah, the best way, which is the best place to hang out. Um, so, yeah, getting Maria on the show is, was when I started, and that's, that's what I, why I call this full disclosure, getting Maria on the show was like one of the first persons that I wanted to have on the show because, yeah, basically to catch up um, um, from Venezuela. There's a lot of, there's a huge story behind it, why she's now, you're now based in the United, United States. Um, so basically catch up as old friends. Um, but first question I always ask everyone is, yeah, like, so what is the, um, yeah, where you grew up, the origin story of like a, like a comic book kind of thing of, of Maria, and then we'll go into like rock and roll, uh, the questions that people sent in. No, oh, absolutely. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, so I'm Maria, I'm from Venezuela, and I'm from the BYU people. Um, the BYU people were in the border between Venezuela and Colombia, and I come from a small city that's called Maracaibo, which is like uh, probably three hours from the border between the two countries. Um, so basically how I grew up is, um, I have like two cultures in me. So my dad, on my dad's side, we're all indigenous. And on my mom's side, they're from Spain and Cuba. Mm. So I grew up within the mixtures. However, since I was like seven or eight, I started participating in the um, indigenous kids movement in Venezuela and then adolescence, and then youth, and then the women's movement. Um, my grandmother is a leader, um, an indigenous leader in Venezuela. So she basically got me in the movement and has taught me a lot. Um, I went to college and I'm a bachelor in publicity and public relations. Um, I started going to the UN, I think when I was like 18. It was very challenging, but then I think that over the years you start learning how it actually works and start to get a little bit better at it. Um, and currently I'm based in the US, um, thanks to life circumstances, um, but I'm doing really good. I'm, I'm grateful for where I am right now. Mm, okay. Um, Maria, that um, the, the composition of your family, right? So like one is um, mixture, the, the mixture. How did, um, did you, how did you experience that? Was there, um, cause I can imagine that from in some families, it can be very, um, complex, uh, comma, conflicting. Um, how did you experience that like regular, growing up? Well, I think since I was small, so in our culture, it's a, we have like different, like, I don't know how to say in English, like caste or like caste between indigenous peoples, like mm -hmm. subgroups. Um, and in our indigenous peoples, you inherit it from your mother. In my case, my mother was not indigenous. So my dad's mother kind of, she's like my actual like indigenous mother. I call her mom, I call her mama. And she gave me like her case. And since like I was small, she always like, 
uh, like told me how important it was to have like cultural pride and how to have cultural identity. Um, so I always grew with that, but at the same time, you know, on my mom's side, like she is very supportive, but like she doesn't wear traditional clothes or like on her side, you know, they're not indigenous. And my grandmother, you know, I say made me, but I was happy to wear it, but sometimes I didn't want to wear it, but I had to all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I was always in traditional clothes. Um, so, you know, it was like kind of like those conflicts, but nothing really major. My mom and like my brothers, everybody always supported me. Plus I was always with my grandmother. I, I lived with her for most of my life because I was mm. like her daughter in a right. sense. Wow. wow. Um, so l l let's, um, yeah, I always like to unpack that a little, the, the, the origin story a little bit. So um, describe to me like how your adult, not like your, um, how do you call it in English? can't remember. The, um, yeah, uh, like, yeah, primary school and then you have like. High school. High school, yeah. Like how, how, how was that life for you? So it was definitely very interesting, but I think the most interesting part was college because mm. when you're growing up in a city, right? So there's a, sometimes there's a lot of indigenous people that don't wear the traditional clothes every day. They only wear it for special occasions. Yeah. I was like one of the exceptions that wore it every single day everywhere. So I was like the girl in school that was always in her traditional clothes. And what I experienced is people would say, oh, you're so pretty. You're not indigenous. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Of course I am. They're like, no, you must be mixed. Then I'm like, I am not mixed. I'm 100% indigenous, just so you know. And then different stereotypes or people would think that I wasn't smart because I was indigenous because I was wearing my traditional clothes all the time. So like I made it a personal challenge to be smarter than everyone. Like I studied so much and I just wanted to prove that I would be number one in my class every year, which I was. So, but I did it with like so much dedication just to prove that point that, yeah, I'm a woman, I'm indigenous, I'm proud of my, you know, cultural identity, and I'm smarter than you. Kind of like that. Wow. There's always, <laughs> like, when, when, when I hear stories like that, there's always this, and also from my own experience, that, um, that juice, that experience, you know, that, like, every time that you feel like slacking, you're like, oh, no, 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 I'm doing for this or because that's, that person said this. What was the, the tipping point for you or the experience that made you, that you keep recalling every time you feel like, um, like slacking and you're like, you know, no, 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 I'm, I'm doing this because of this. So I think um, there was one experience one time, um, it, I think it was like my first week in college, um, a professor, they wanted to do like a group work and everybody, I remember everybody chose their like, their like student members to be and they, nobody chose me hmm. so then and i i don't know i imagine it's because i wasn't my traditional clothing um and then i was like no i'll, I'll do it by myself because the teacher was like well let me see which group has less people inside of it and then I'll, you can just be in that one and i was like no i'll do it by myself it's fine so that's when i that triggered the mindset in me that i'm like well you guys think i'm not smart enough to be in your groups now you're gonna, not going to be smart enough enough to be in my groups mm, that's mm. when i decided to be smarter than everyone isn't and it's like um since i have the exact same experience and for me it gives me a lot of juice as in like you know what um i'm gonna i'll, I'll work you all like i'm, I'm gonna do um, you you're gonna wish that you're know, like you were part of my my circle part of my team or whatever i i was um yeah it's always like this underdog position that people always put you in and I'm and some people will like have problems with it and um yeah at least for from 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 my experience like I just embraced it you know like this underdog position you know what I'll do it you know I'll, I'll show yeah. you yeah um and um so, so that like was for, from um for college onwards and how did you um yeah how how does that um uh, yeah also factor into your um, you, saw, you talked about mindset, uh, became a part of your mindset. Um, did it also become a factor in your UN work or going to the UN? Um, how was that experience? So I think that um, the first time that I went to the UN, I didn't really know what to expect. 
Um, Cause you no, know, it's like a whole new world. It was like my first time in New York. It was like my second time in the country, first time in New York, like without my parents and all of that. And then what I found myself was extremely underprepared because I would see people like you and you would like read the articles off of your mind, like article 17. And I was like, oh my God. And then like people like Thomas or from Finland or like Tanya, they just like knew it all so well. And I was like, I am so underprepared. Like I don't want to be an embarrassment here in my country. So that motivated me to like start studying, you know, like the UN declaration, different uh, like uh, legal framework that indigenous peoples have that we have so that I can kind of own it more and be more empowered over it. But that was definitely my starting point. I was totally unprepared. Right. And, and, and um, so you started off with the, and so, so what, what year are we talking when you, when you went first went to the UN? Was that 2000 and... I think it was like 2011, I think. Okay. 2011, 2012. Maybe. So she, 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 you, you went into the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus. Um, so it was, yeah, it, it was developing for, at least from 2009, because when I was Youth Caucus co-chair, um, <laughs> like <laughs> it, was, it was just like just a couple of yeah, youth hanging around around a table. And then it, it started developing and um, yeah, so how was that first experience with, so you, you go to the UN, did you immediately gravitate towards, or no, sorry, did you uh, get the advice to go to the Youth Caucus or did you find it yourself? Um, like how, yeah, like, like how did you find, did you find your bearings with, within that first um, week or first meeting, sorry. I always went as a part of an organization. So mm -hmm. we went like as the Continental Network of Indigenous Women. And we always had like a group of like young women and the youth at once. We were like five. And there was always a mixture between like the inexperienced, like me and somebody with more experience. So there was like Tanya and other people that had been to the youth caucus before. And there were the ones that told us like, oh no, we have to go to this youth caucus. And then we all made our agendas. Um, and that was like the first time that we went. And I think that when we started going, it was like Jocelyn from Taiwan and Thomas were the co-chairs. That mm -hmm. was, yeah, I remember that. Um, and then, you know, you started meeting the people, the different regions and start to like get to know the actual dynamics and how to move around it. But definitely we had people that guided us towards the caucus. I didn't like find it, you know, randomly. Right. Yeah. No, no, that no. makes, makes a lot of sense. I think that's also like the best way to, um, cause there's a lot of, a lot of people, unfortunately, unfortunately that, um, yet yeah, they, they work, work all year around for the ticket to New York, um, to be able to stay at a YMCA or whatever. Mm -hmm. And like a lot of respect for them, 100%. And the only thing that they have is this piece of paper, um, their statement that they want to read and, but that's it. There's there's nothing actually between the the, the statement and yeah, like and, and there's there's no there's not somebody that like oh hey by the way um, this is the best way to do it to become effective if you want to use the United Nations. And I wish there was a better infrastructure for all Indigenous peoples, not just the Youth Caucus. Youth Caucus is doing a great thing, uh, but for all Indigenous peoples, because. Um, there's a lot, and there are a lot of people, Indigenous people that go for the first time that are actually already in their 40s, 50s, you know, like, um, and yeah, they just don't know what to do. And then they go home disappointed um, because like either they fell off the list, um, only list, only went up to 25, they were number 26 yeah. and yeah, go home, home disappointed. And there's something that like, I think that's the, um, yeah, um, for me at least, I think that's the, responsibility of a movement of a caucus to make sure that nobody gets left behind with the talk about SDGs no one leave no one behind but we have to do it ourselves as well um definitely when it comes to pre preparations um right let, let's w the transition because when you t when, when, we, when we talked uh, um before uh, as in like when was the last time we talked like i think a couple of months ago sorry coronavirus kind of thing um we we caught up a little bit and i caught up with you like you living in the us like how what what is for me it's like a gap you know like un 
all of a sudden you're in finance now. That it's almost like you're going from lava to ice age. Like, like I, I like so. So, um, like, what was what was the um, yeah, experience or like what made you um, yeah, decide to go into finance? Yeah. Um, so what originally happened was I was in Venezuela and I was in our continental organization and we made an alliance with this um, NGO that's called Plan International. And with them, we made an alliance with the German government and we funded a program that's called um, the, uh, it's like a, an empowerment school for indigenous girls on politics. I don't remember. It's like translating mm -hmm. it in English and it was going to be based in Panama but the program was gonna be directed in Peru and Guatemala. And they want, they were looking for a, a director of the program. And I was like, well, I love this program. We all helped create it. So I interviewed for it and I got the job, it was super exciting. And I was going to live in Panama um, and I was already set to go. I had just graduated college, everything was perfect. Um, and then the government of my country fought with the government of Panama and we weren't allowed to go there anymore without a visa and they denied me the visa. So at the same time, my family had an approved green card in the US. Um, so my mom and my brothers were here and my mom was like, well, you shouldn't let go of the green card because it's like one option for you. And I thought that I could come to the US, get the green card. I thought it would arrive like in 15 weeks, in 15 days. Because I read online that you could enter Panama as a U.S. resident without a visa. So I was like, okay, I'll get the green card, go to Panama, and then I'll have my job and everything will be okay. Once I came here, I realized that first the green card doesn't come for like three months. And then after it comes, you can't leave for another three months. And they won't let you go into Panama without accomplishing those six months so that you're an actual permanent resident. And then the job in Panama wasn't going to wait for me for six months. So I resigned the position. Um, and I was like, yeah, I'll help. I'll be a consultant. I'll help you guys in any way I can. Um, so I was just here. I had really bad jobs at first because I was just applying randomly um, until one company hired me as a temp, like a temporary employee. Then I worked really hard to get hired full time. Um, and then I started studying and I got three licenses so that I could be a financial advisor in the U S mm -hmm. and here I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like financial advisor. So, um, and, and that, there were a lot of questions actually, not, not, yeah, there were a lot of questions actually about financial advice. So I, I don't want to make this like a Q and a on financial advice. Um, so, do, 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 so, so you live in the U S now. So how, how is life in U S for you right now? Um, yeah, like, um, are you finding your bearings right now? Um, do you feel comfortable? Um, how do you, yeah, live your life? So it's an adjustment, I think. Um, I come from a very different culture, like the Latino culture. We're very touchy-feely, we're happy people, we're very family-oriented. I feel like, especially the state where I am is not really like that. So at first it was like really hard because, you know, you come here, you don't have any friends, you don't know anyone. And everybody here is friends from like preschool. So they all know each other forever. And you're just like the foreigner that's here. Um, so it took me a while to make friends, but now I've made friends and I'm a little more established. I can't say that I love it. Like I'm not like living my dream, um, but I am grateful because like there's a lot of people that struggle and you know, thank God I'm not struggling. Mm. So I'm grateful for where I'm at. It's just not necessarily what I thought I would be, if it makes sense. And what, um, probably like an obvious follow-up question, like what, what was, what would, did you imagine? Like what would, would be the dream? What, what, what did you wanna, what did you wanna be right now? Actually when things would go the way you wanted it to go? If it was up to me, I would be in Panama in that job because the biggest struggle for me growing up and being in the movement is that I don't come from a wealthy family. So I come from a very hardworking family and in Venezuela, the economical situation is tough. Um, so I needed to get a job one way or another. Um, so that job was perfect for me because I was like, well, 
I'm going to have a salary, I will have a job and I will do what I love doing. I will be in the indigenous people's communities. I will be, you know, um, sharing my knowledge, helping people, making the programs, you know, doing all things that we love to do. So mm -hmm. I always imagine that's where I would be because like that's where I was happy. That's where I had clarity. I had like a 10 year plan, a 20 year plan. This is everything that I'm going to do. Now I'm just like, well, this is my plan for this year. And then next year we'll see what happens. Kind mm. of like that. And is um, in, that, in that scenario, um, is there a, is there a scene or is it something that you, you, you could see yourself going back into the movement or going, no, no, no sorry, I'm asking this wrong. Um, going back to the UN, because you can always be in the movement, like you can always be of value in the movement, but like your work or like doing stuff at the UN, is, it, is there a scenario that, that, you, that you imagine that uh, could allow for that? I, I do, it's just in my mind, like I always have this struggle, like man, there's all these people, you know, like in Venezuela, that they're the ones that should be going to the UN mm -hmm. now because they're the ones that actually know what's going on. Mm -hmm. I might be talking to them and they're informing me, you know, we're sharing, but I'm not living it anymore. Yeah. So in my mind, like I would go to the UN if like I'm 100% funding myself and I'm going maybe as a consultant or to help, not really to be like, I don't know how to say it in English, like not to be the person that's necessarily speaking or doing all the advocacy. I just don't feel it's my anymore. I feel like my place now is to help bring the voices. You know, if somebody comes from Venezuela, I can maybe tell them or South America, well, this might be the best route or maybe talk to this person or do this, not necessarily me doing that anymore. Mm, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can definitely see. Um, Cause in my, in my scenario, at least in my life, um, I live in Europe. My my uh, my peoples are in the Pacific, and um, I always have that that dead chip on my shoulder, as in as in that imposter syndrome. And like, yeah, uh, I think that's what I have right now. <laughs> yeah, like so that, that's why I've, I I very much relate to it to what what you're saying, as in um, I always have this feeling. Yeah, but I'm going, but actually they should be going, um, and. Luckily, few of my elders told me like, you know, um, I'm, not, I'm not saying this, this goes the same for you, obviously, um, but maybe, yeah, there's something, something in there that you can find inspiration in. Um, what they told me is that um, if um, you can be our eyes and ears and from time to time our, our mouthpiece when we are not able to go. Um, so that's, and, and, and it also gives you a, little, a high level of accountability and responsibility as in like, you know what, I'm, 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 I'm doing this, but there's also like people on the ground in, on, in the in country um, that I always have to like check back with, check in with and not go off. And, and cause there's a lot of people that do that. They just go off to the UN and they just like, hey, I'm representative of this ambassador, this blah, blah, blah. And you know, and you just know um, that they have zero uh, accountability, yeah. zero responsibility. Um, so like, I think, yeah, the, the place where you're coming from is, is a very uh, um, a strong position of uh, like this mindset of humility. Uh, that's very admirable. And how you made your life uh, or, or, yeah, how you um, went with the roll with the punches, I would say, of life. Um, yeah, mad respect for that, sis. Um, and um, thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Because um, I know that it's, it's, it requires a lot of, yeah, confidence, trust, vulnerability to be, um, to be able to share that. Um, and, I think, and I think there's, you're not the only one uh, that, that, um, that goes through it. And hopefully with, the, with, with this conversation that, that a lot more people are willing to yeah to step up and 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 yeah um share the, the stories because yeah it's um basically also the reason why i'm doing doing this podcast you know to share my stories and listen to other people's stories Absolutely. um th thanks so much um i don't know how to bridge this um but i'm just i mean i'm <laughs> i'm gonna try this um obviously people sending questions thank you so much for that um 
So uh, yeah, let, let's jump right into it. Um, you already talked a bit, a little bit before. All right, first question: um, How should I approach attending a conference? Um, how do I prepare if I'm going just to make contacts? Um, so uh, Maria, you go first, and then I'll I'll I'll, I'll add if I have to add. Anyway. <laughs> Absolutely. No, for sure. So I think the best way to prepare for a conference is actually know what you're attending. So mm -hmm. like if you're attending a permanent forum session, okay, you should know what the agenda is and you should know what the side events are. So the parallel events, and then who are the speakers in those parallel events? Because if you're going to meet contacts, I imagine then maybe you might know who you want to meet, or maybe you know what type of people you want to meet. And then depending on that, you would maybe narrow it down to a certain event. Like there was one time I wanted to meet this person from, in Spanish it's called UNFPA. It's like the UN for like- uh, Food like program? People and development. Yeah. I don't know how to say it in English. No, sorry, yeah, go ahead, yeah. I don't know that one. The one that's the UN agency for like population and development. I don't know how to mm. say it in English. Um, and I wanted to meet somebody from there because we wanted um, to have some concrete actions in Venezuela. So then I started tracking down, okay, what are the parallel events? So these, are there going to be any speakers from that agency? And then if there were, I would try to either be a speaker as well, or just be very early so I could try to lobby. So those are good strategies to have. Um, also, I feel like it's so important to be a part of an organization and not to go there alone, like representing yourself or something, you know, more narrow, because it just opens up doors. It's not the same me saying, oh, I'm Maria from the way you people of Venezuela, than me saying I'm Maria and I'm coming, bringing the voice of these three organizations that are endorsing me. So I think those are always good things to do, to be prepared, be on time. For some reason, indigenous people, we're always late. It's just, it's a shame, but or it, do not show up. Like yeah, either, either. Or, yeah, it's a fact. Mm -hmm. Those are all things that we need to be, you know, better at um, and always just be prepared. There's nothing worse than being underprepared. I know about that. Right. Not. And um, um, let me ask you a quick follow-up question. Um, did you have any difficulties or can you imagine people having difficulties staying indigenous in a very diplomatic environment where everything is politicized? I absolutely do think it is hard. Um, so it's hard because everybody has their own agenda. Mm. So the governments have their agenda, the UN has their agenda, certain organizations have their own individual agendas. So you have to be very aware of what it is that you're trying to accomplish, what your organization is there for, and then set that goal up for yourself. So even if you're talking, you know, to that state representative and they just go in a different direction in the conversation how do you steer the conversation back into what you want it to be because mm -hmm. maybe it's not a comfortable topic for them it's hard but you have to be strategic yeah like 100 um yeah i have i have one thing to add actually to, to what you're saying because definitely pre be prepared like don't show up uh yeah read the mandate read the theme uh the last thing you, the last thing you want the last thing you want is finally you get to present your statement they call you raise your hand all that everyone is watching you uh looking at you and you start with your statement and you're off topic you're off theme and you get the you get gaffled you know and it's time is gold to indigenous peoples you know when you get the three minutes and it's not even three minutes anymore it's like two minutes um like time is gold so be sure that you're in within the mandate and and be, make sure that you're uh, address the theme. I'm, I'm not going to call out the p person that that sent in this question actually because uh, like how do I prepare prepare if I'm going just to make contacts? If you're indigenous and you're going to the United Nations only to make contacts, you're wasting time and money. Yeah. Because um, for me, you, like you do it, I do it. Like we spend a lot of our own money to go to the UN, like uh, stay at, at, at cheap places, um, eat as cheap as possible, um, just to make, make be able to survive for those two weeks um, in, in New York. Um, so you better, you know, like, like make worth every second you're in New York. Um, so you, like you said, you know, like side events and everything else. Um, so making contacts is, um, I would say like 1% 
um, like a one one percent of yeah what you should be doing at the, at the United Nations. Um, in addition to lobbying, uh, presenting a statement, and even presenting a statement, it should be like five percent of of, every, of everything. Mm -hmm. Like, you can, there's so much you can do um, in those like six hours you're at the UN, or there's one or two weeks um, you're in New York. Um, so that, oh, that's the only thing that I would that I would add. add. But um, thank you so much, Maria, for 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 highlighting that as well. Mm -hmm. um, do 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 anything else? No, otherwise it it becomes like a monologue or like a, a training on like how to how no, to you, participate one other thing i don't mm -hmm. remember his name and and it's a shame because we're friends this guy he's from guatemala he's a leader he was the president of the forum i think like in 2016 long hair esteban and he was like the representative for youth in the experts alvaro pop yes alvaro pop i remember that he very specifically said that when you're reading the statements like just to stop reading about the 500 years of colonizations and dragging that out. He's like, everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. Use your three minutes wisely to the point. What is it that you're wanting to say? That, and that hit me because all of our statements as an organization had like two paragraphs about colonization, racism, and that what we wanted. So now we, well, they restructured that now. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. yeah and and also like like you brought something up and um it's also like don't read as if you're being chased by a um i don't know by a hyena or something or by by a lion or cheetah <laughs> like like or you you don't have to yell through the microphone yeah. like, like speak at a normal pace normal voice like you're in a radio show whatever um because people like like they they, they think like all right um, two minutes I need to get in as much as possible yeah. you're dealing with interpreters you know like you, people need to be able to yeah like, to able to <laughs> whatever you want to say it needs to compute it needs to register especially okay. what you want the you want to do um, so yeah like final yeah from at least for me final point um, read at a normal pace and and prepare like practice beforehand a couple of times um, because you know, like you don't want to like go in. Mutual friend of ours, I'm not going to name names, um, had to read a statement on behalf of somebody else. <laughs> it was written in a uh, from the perspective of a female. He had to read it. Um, so, read before you present. So, um, yeah, you can know where the commas are, all the periods, or when you had to change. Um, her or me, her to him or she to him, she um, she to he you know like so yeah um, best way to prepare um, yeah that's that's all, all, all I'm gonna say otherwise oh, and there's so many things and it, and it, we learn by doing like we, we, we fall and we, yeah. we we just get up and like all right yeah next time we won't do that again won't do that exactly yeah all right um all right. Awesome. Next question. Do you ever get sick of the UN? And if so, how do you get through it? Oh, yeah. I got sick of the UN. There was a period, I think, like two years where I, I didn't go anymore. Mm. Um, and I got sick of it in a sense. I was also very immature at that time. And I think I wasn't looking at the bigger picture because I kept seeing that we went to the UN and there was all these resources, you know, for us to go. And and then we read all these statements and like the governments were like, oh yeah, that sounds cool. And then you go back home and everything is exactly the same. And then you're like, well, two weeks of my life just went by in New York. So then I was just like, you know, maybe this is just not for me. Mm. Maybe I'll just stay here. Um, Cause I always did like workshops in different communities and I really enjoyed that. Um, so I thought that maybe I would just dedicate myself to that. And then my grandmother was the one that made me come to my like my senses. And she was like, well, do you think in the 60s and the 70s, it was easy for us? Or like when we were the working group in Geneva, we were there doing the work and maybe wouldn't see it that everything got better the next day. But now, you know, 40 years later, what the youth is experiencing now is better than what we experienced before. Mm. There has been some improvements. So, I guess those lessons got back in me. Like you're part of a movement. You're going there to bring your voice because it's better to be heard than to not be heard. 
even if they don't do anything about it, at least they know you did your part. So I think that's what made me get through it. But I think it's very easy to get, you know, over the UN and not want to go anymore. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, um, all right, first personal experience, and I can't believe I'm going to say this. Um, <laughs> I was, so my mom took me to the UN when I was like a, like a kid uh, to, to Geneva. Okay. And it, it didn't even compute. And then, like it was like yeah I'll go walk with my mom and everything else and like carrying her 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 books and her papers getting coffee and all that so and then you get to, to that point when you're in your te- teenage years um you join earth again and um f- so you have the working group on indigenous populations first for the first week and then we stayed for another week for the subcommission on human rights, which is like a little bit higher up uh, the UN, UN ladder. Um, working group was fun for me because you know you get to interact with indigenous peoples, with your friends, with your peers. You hang out, you you laugh. Even though I was like I don't know, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, I don't know. Um, hang out at the UN beach. There's actually UN beach in Geneva. Um, so yeah. It, not not an official beach but they call it a beach it's like a club kind of thing anyway um i'm I'm going off track here um so subcommission which is very like yeah it is actually human rights kind of stuff it's a lot of talking and everything else i was so bored i was so bored and that i actually from time to time seriously can't believe that I'm I'm, i'm going to share it anyway um, then I just went to the toilet and slept. <laughs> it's valid. I mean, you were a teenager. Oh man, I was, and and then like, um, yeah, and I didn't, I didn't do that once, multiple times. My mom was in, was in the, was in the meeting room, like waiting for her turn to speak, because she had like six minutes of speaking time back then, and I was like, just like wandering around the UN, um, opening up doors, like what's here, what's over there. Um, so I was, yeah, like kind of fed up with, not, not fed up, but I'm bored. And then to talk a little bit about, um, yeah, like, like getting sick of it, um, was now well, mostly, um, I didn't get sick of the, you went, I got sick of the movement. Um, uh, not the work, but the movement. Cause I, there was some, was some point in life or in, in, I think it was around 2012, between 2012, 2014 world conference, it became very toxic. So toxic. So toxic. I think that's when I got fed up with it. Okay. Yeah. The worst. Yeah. And I I was, and I was a GCG member for the Pacific region and I got shit over me. And I was like, oh man, like, is this. Is this a movement? Is this solidarity, what, what we're talking about? Is this self-determination and everything that we're talking about, but what we're talking about to the UN, but we're not actually practicing it? Like we're, we're not doing it? And I was so disappointed. Um, I, I actually cried at one point. Um, there, was, at, there was, I did this project access, uh, this training program, and we did one evaluation and I just cried because there's only, that was the only spot that I felt safe, comfortable, um, yeah, to, to share. And whereas once, yeah, like that back then, like 2012, 2014, it was so toxic. I can, I'm so glad it's over now at the World Conference in terms of the toxicity. Yeah. What we accomplished, perfect, fine, it, it's amazing. But the toxicity that went before it, oh man, that's something that we should never yeah. have to go through again. In the preparatory events, everything, it's just like, yeah, it was a lot. Even when, you remember we went to the boat? Even mm-hmm. like deciding who was getting the tickets to the boat, like who was like the VIPs of the indigenous people, <sighs> who wasn't, it was a nightmare. It's a full, full disclosure, the people that people know. I saw like in the, um, uh, myself and Traveling Foundation, we wanted to celebrate, you know, like the, uh, like the World Conference. So we asked around, and um, Hornblower, which is a, a company in, 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 in New York, they offered this big boat. We didn't have to pay, pay anything off this, this amazing boat. 
with food and everything else, the only thing that they wanted, like, it's like, all right, maybe you should hand out boarding passes, tickets and everything else, just so that we have an idea of yeah. how many people will, will get on board. People started treating this, these like VIP tickets for like Super Bowl game, whatever, or like um, Oscar after party kind of thing, which doesn't make any sense, you know? Like, so like people actually like being very toxic about it as well. I'm just like, it's just a fun get together after three, three, four years, not three years of hard work. So don't, don't, don't put too much um, thought into it as in like, as in like, vip tickets it was like yeah just like but, you know like however my very best memory mm. in the whole un movement that i participated was that night actually because mm. for me remember when we were you went out dancing with everybody remember when you went out dancing <laughs> yeah i remember that's like engraved in my mind and then we were all dancing together i I had the time of my life. Like I always say that was the absolute best night. Like I think of my life. I loved it. Yeah. I, like, I that that was um was aside from it it wasn't a boat, it was a ship. It was the thing was huge. It was huge. It was a huge ship. Yeah. And then yeah. um yeah. People were actually blowing off steam. Yeah. So when, when we saw like gathering around a circle and, and people started yeah, it did, yeah. um Indigenous peoples, state representatives, uh, special rapporteurs, and everything else. It was, yeah, I can, I can, um, I can, I can see that, that 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 is one of the highlights of things in a movement. And aside from the Pacific men doing the, the haka and and everything, I else. love that. Just FYI, <laughs> I thought it was so much fun. And then I tried to look for it in the hashtags in Instagram. Nobody recorded it because I wanted to see it again. If you it have was, it, you have to send it to me. You have yeah, to. Send all right, it. yeah, I'll, I'll send it to you. I'll, 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 send, I'll send it. I'll, um, I'll send it through you, uh, like okay. Instagram, whatever. Yeah. All right. Um, before we start um, unveiling like um, a lot of like embarrassing moments, let's move <laughs> on quickly to the next question. Um, <laughs> uh, what do you think is the? Oh shit! This, this is not a good bridge either. What do you think is the most critical financial thing that people in the movement should do? So this is like a mood breaker, but yeah, go ahead. No, it's a very important question. Mm. And I think that organizations should focus on having their own funding to attend places and to do their own workshops. Like speaking like for me, sometimes like I went to events and my funding was from like a different organization. And like, sometimes like I got like a per diem like three days later, which for some people that would be fine. For somebody in my situation, I was literally stealing sandwiches from the side events, but I never let anybody know that, but that was like a fact. Yeah, I was like stealing sandwiches, like breakfast, lunch, dinner, because I didn't have any money to buy anything in New York. Like my country, the dollar is super expensive, but if our organizations would foresee things like that, I think it would make it easier, but also to do things locally. Because when you don't have funding locally, it is so hard to implement a plan. Because I don't know if it happens in your country, but in my country, whenever you do like a workshop, um, it's like customary to at least serve coffee or something. Um, but sometimes we didn't have that. So like I would take coffee from like my house without my mom knowing and like making it or trying to do things like that, which makes the job so much harder because we, this, we all volunteer in this movement. Um, it's all volunteer work, but it's a job in a sense because we put so much effort into this. We study so much of it. Um, so if we had that funding, I think it would make our lives so much easier. And also there's like tons of opportunities that you just miss because you have no way to go. Mm. Or there's only, there's only five people that can go. Maybe there's like a six person that's so valuable. It's so important, but there's no funding for that person. You know? Yeah. So if we had our own funding, I think everything would be better. And, and any thoughts on, and it, this, um, first of all, I suck at fundraising, um, but any thoughts on, because that has been on my mind for a while. Uh, the punchline is um, grants makes indigenous peoples vulnerable. 
um, as in, yeah, it, it is very ad hoc, not very, um, not how do you say it? Okay. So what I use, so I think it depends, but mm. I think it depends on the terms of the grant because for example, on the example of the um, leadership school in South America, so that's a plan that like the Continental Network and Clint International are moving along, but it's with the German funding. Mm. And I remember that when we were in various workshops designing the program, a lot of the representatives from like that organization and from like the Germany based people, they were like, oh no, because the focus has to be feminism or the focus has to be this. We were like, no, no, that's not the focus. It should be this. And eventually they understood that, yeah, you are funding this program, but you're not directing it. Like your mm -hmm. input is well appreciated, but it's going to be directed to, you know, how we see fit for indigenous peoples. Right. So I think as long as you get grants like that, then it's okay. But mm -hmm. if you get a grant from like an organization that wants you to say what they want to say, doesn't represent your values, I don't believe it's worth it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Th thanks so much for clearing that up. Um, because I, I see, I'm not, not, again, I'm not experiencing it myself, uh, but people um, say that they're like, it makes them feel that they're at the mercy of, uh, of funders. It, like, it all depends on like, if that fund is being able to give them grants or money to go to the UN in Geneva, New York, Bonn, whatever. And um, on the other side of that conversation is also, or different vantage point of that conversation is also that a lot of people and would love to hear your thoughts about that is that when they, they talk about funding and mercy judgment um they feel like oh no that's colonial um i just i'm not going to participate in that um so yeah so so i'm i'm, I'm not going to participate in, in fundraising or like ask, asking so these funds for for money I don't think that would be like the best mindset to have mm. because the truth of the fact is that if we don't participate, we're not doing anything. We're never going to change our realities. So I think it's perfectly valid to participate. I would even encourage for there to be like a fundraising committee within the indigenous peoples and they would be the negotiators, you know, with like this big, um, like the big companies or the big NGOs to get the grants and then to like distribute the grants evenly among like the continents. But without grants, we wouldn't be anywhere because like thinking it rationally, like if we lived back home, if we didn't have like maybe like the job that I have now or whatever job that you have, like in my experience, what would be my opportunity to go to the UN? Zero. I would never, like I would have never been able to participate. That's a reality. I would have never been able to afford a ticket, even working like five years for it. That's yeah. the truth. Mm -hmm. So funding is very important. And all of the organizations do it because um, that's how we participate. It's just how we go about it. So there should mm -hmm. be like strategic people maybe having those conversations with the grantors. Yeah, yeah. And I think of, I think what, what a lot of people... Um, yeah, you also add to that to that whole conversation, which is no, no, sorry, sorry, I'm, I should rephrase that. Um, be humble, you know, like you're doing it for a cause, like uh, and like if you need money to go to, to go somewhere, you know, so like have the humility to, you know, go go to the funder or if you can't go to a funder, work overtime. Like that's what I do. Like I, I have the at least that's what I think I have the humility to work overtime um, with graveyard shifts and everything else just to be able to pay my flights to New York or Geneva and be able to, to stay there and have a feed and from time to time have a drink with you and, and every other people at, at, at Keats or whatever, you know, um, have the humility um, because you're doing it for something. You're doing it for your peoples. Uh, and, you know, like if, if, like you said, you know, 100%, if you're not going there's a voice that will be missed. You know, like you won't be able to speak truth to power, what you, what you want to do, right? So, yeah, I think then there's a lot of like um, ego involved as well that you just put in, put it, put in like a healthy dose of of humility in there as well, and that will that will get you a lot further than 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 um, putting your ego and pride ahead of your ahead of that. I agree.
uh, uh, sorry, yeah, this because this hit, hit a little bit like very close to home for me. Um, all right, for, for next question: What is the best advice you can give to someone who wants to start in the movement but is still working full time? Well, this is like this doesn't even need a bridge. This is like very. <laughs> <laughs> so I think. Um, I experienced that not with work full time, but with university full time. It's very hard to manage both. Mm. So I think you need to understand that first, like you need to be strategic. And like, if you have employers, tell them the importance of your job, why you're going and maybe say, well, you know, I, I might not be able to work this week, but I'll make it up to you, you know, like in weekends or like I'll work like a night shift or whatever. But then also there's one thing to keep in mind that we can't be individualized all the time. Like I always said, you know, sometimes I had exams and my teachers were just like, if you don't miss, if like, if you don't take it, or if you're failing the semester, you're not going to be able to retake it. So then I had to say, I'm sorry, I can't go to the UN because like my personal priority was graduating. But mm. there's, there always needs to be one other person in your organization that's just as capable as you that can go. Like you can't be the only one that participates. So you have to balance that out. I think it's being strategic and making sure that your surrounding is aware of why you're doing it. Like you're not going to see the Statue of Liberty. Like you're going to do a job. It's a job that you're doing basically. Mm -hmm. um, and on the times that you can't go, you can't be frustrated over it. You know, just say, I can't go, but I'm sure, you know, this person, my sister, my brother is just as capable. They'll do an excellent job. Like you can't have it all sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like um, I very much also when I went to law school and, 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 and when I went to college, um, same thing. Um, like exams and what would, would coincide with, with meetings of permanent forum. And I'm like, ah, oh, shit. Um, so I tried to like move a little bit. Like I, yeah, like, like, like always try to find like what is um, short of illegal, you know, like, like, all right, um, please, what, what is possible within, within what, what you can do for me. Um, it, yeah, that was something that I, did um but in retrospect probably not the best approach you know like like sometimes you do have to um um yeah have to like take a knee as in like you know what yeah that this this meeting i won't be able to attend because this is what a lot of people miss out on or not miss out on forget is that um you also have your own life you know you need to like you need to have a, have a stable foundation if you want to be able to participate fully into the movement because if movement is very it goes up and down or like it, it goes like three-dimensional um there's a lot of things going on and you can get sucked into it and that is what i felt um like i got sucked got sucked sucked into it um so you have to like struggle like to be able to on a personal stage like to keep your head, head above water um so definitely find your own personal balance first, build that and see how, like how you can contribute to, to the, to the movement. I think that would, for people that are starting in, for people that are starting in, I would, I would highly recommend, highly recommend that from own personal experience. Otherwise you just, and also, yeah, I fully agree with what you said, you know, like uh, don't be the, the want to be the go-to guy, like be that bottleneck, like, Oh, like the world will not, move without me because uh, that is when you talk about movement and this is what, how i learned it i learned it the hard way when you talk about movement it is about uh, duplicating yourself and making sure that everyone else has the same level of knowledge capacities and that that's the goal that's why i'm doing this podcast and everything else um but before says i was selfish i was like no you know no, no, no. I'll go, you, you shouldn't go, I'll go. And all of a sudden you, you're building yourself up, but by keeping everyone else down, you know, mm -hmm. like you're, you're building the highest building in the, in, the, in the city by breaking down all the other buildings around you. Whereas it's so much better to like, you know, build the movement up, like so that we all can benefit, all can become stronger. 
Um, so that is something that, um, uh, yeah, when, when, when I read, read the question, well, what, what, how I synthesized the question and how I, um, how, how, how I thought about it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Um, um, this is a final question. That's a good one. Um, what do you suggest I do to help my community when I'm working in another country? So I think one of the best things that we can do is not lose our connection. Um, I feel like while we help ourselves and our ancestors is still having, you know, that culture identity and being proud. And particularly what I do is I always try to help, even if it's via Zoom. If somebody wants to do a workshop and they're not sure how to go around it or don't have the contacts, I tell them or help them, oh, we should do this or do this, or I can participate via Zoom and I'll do like this lecture. Or if they want to do a document, you know, maybe you can have some input there. I think there's a lot of ways that you can help, even if you're not there, like present. Um, just like us, like we're via Zoom. You can do that with, you know, your organization in your country. So maybe you're not the one that's doing it, but you're like the consultant now. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how I help now. I'm more of a consultant. So they ask me things and they're like, oh, um, I have no idea about this document. We don't have good internet. Can you research it for us and make like, uh, like, you know, like make it more understandable, like in better words for us or translate it for us. So like I try to do those types of things, kind of like a secretary, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but if that's what's needed of me, that's what I do. Sometimes yeah. you can dictate what people need from you. You mm -hmm. just have to do what's needed. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I think I 100% agree. And I think the punchline is um, do what is needed and not what, what you think that is needed. Yeah. Um, because when you're out of the community, you're, you're not in tune with what's going on with the needs and everything else. So you're in a supportive role. Yeah. Um, so... Um, if the community thinks like you need you to, I don't know, do co make copies or do research or something, that is what they need and, and do it as best as you can, as much as, as, as good as you would do something that you do want to do, you know, because okay. that's, that's, that's what, what the community needs. And I think, um, and it is also a very good, um, at least from my experience is that, um, like I said, like you can beat eyes and ears. Um, so inform them as much as possible so that they can make informed decisions. Um, so not all the information that is available gets to them as in, yeah. in, in, a, in a contextual way. It's good, it gets to them raw as in like, this is happening, that's happening. But how does it relate to your situation? Um, so that kind of analysis or advice can be very helpful as well. Um, cause you're in a, in a different, if not better position, um, to analyze and, or, and, or convey, um, the contextual and uh, like context about it. Cause right now context is, is, is key. I think, uh, for, for, uh, for, for the, yeah, w when you want to transmit information from, f yeah, from outside of the country into like in, 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 in the community and yeah, like basically do whatever you can and yeah just just make sure you don't piss off the community um 100 you never <laughs> piss off the elders oh That's man yeah what, what 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 is your worst um uh no 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 not so with that don't like let, what's um uh, i was almost uh, like what is your worst experience but l l let's not go there in, into a negative way um any, yeah, anything that you saw like, oh, oh my God, I helped create this or do this from afar? Any experience in, experiences in that? Yeah. Um, so specifically with Venezuela, um, they were trying to do different workshops on political empowerment and how to use like different uh, like international instruments or documents that we have and maybe apply it in Venezuela or how they like relate to the national laws. So like I did like a very high level study in comparison and gave them the documents. Um, it was like with our national organization. 
Um, and then they started to do the workshops. And when they kept going, they were like, oh, we need to tweak this and tweak that. What do you think? And I was like, well, maybe we could do it this way or that way. So I think I help. I really like that because I was like, well, I'm so far away. You know, I have nothing to do with it anymore. But still, in a way, like I was helpful. And in that way of being helpful, you know, you're contributing to the movement. So I can't say that I'm like 100% away from it. Like yeah. any type of help that you can do makes it better. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, um, that's such a, yeah, like, a, no, I should, I should not try to say this because it would only like, I would, I would, yeah, I should not try to say this. Um, it's such a, a, a very, um, fulfilling experience actually that being able to be a value i think yeah, that that's what i want to say a value a value uh and staying relevant uh for for your for your community um any 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 uh because we're coming to the end any final thoughts anything that um yeah you're like oh my god Ghazali, like i can't believe you did not ask me about this or um yeah any, any things that you want people to think about um anything that comes to your mind yeah so i think like the major challenge that i face now is like being in a total like non-indigenous environment because like i've tried to visit even like a like the like the reserves and all of that but they're like 14 hours from me so i haven't been able to do that so it's like well how do i maintain my cultural identity you know and still you know be who i am in this environment and i think that being in the UN and like how I grew up and everything in my organization has helped me do that. So I think that everybody, like, even if you don't live in your country anymore, you're not in your community, you're not even like actively in the movement, you're still indigenous. You should still be proud of your ancestors. Like wherever I go, I, I'm like, oh yeah, my name is Maria Alberto. I'm from the indigenous peoples of Venezuela, the YU people. And they're like, what is that? And I'm like, well, you know, like Native Americans but in South America. Mm, we just call mm. them indigenous there. Yeah. Um, and everybody's like in shock because like that's not a normal thing here for people to say, I guess, or maybe in the state where I am. Mm. So I think that's awesome. And maybe like it would be cool if you had like a round table to just speak to people, you know, that are like in different positions in their countries or outside their countries and how they maintain their cultural identities with having, you know, like Western societies like up there next all the time, like mm. especially for youth, cause you know, it's so easy to get carried away. Like, oh, I don't wanna wear my traditional clothes anymore yeah. or I don't wanna identify as indigenous cause I wanna be modern or I wanna be this. So how to have that balance? I think mm. that's an interesting conversation. Um, two things. One is, um, is, is that, living outside of your community, living outside of your, your country does not make you less indigenous. I think that is, that's a very um, important lesson for people uh, or not a lesson, um, but, but yeah, for, for people that are in, in, in a similar situation, um, a very good advice um, to like to, yeah, you're still indigenous. Like it doesn't matter what you, what you eat or like if you changed where you live, what, what, what you eat, what you wear, you know, you're still indigenous. Um, so um, yeah, don't, don't try to, yeah, don't try to change that. And second, I'm actually kind of glad actually you started talking about this um, because um, this, we are planning on doing a follow-up to the to webinar series and that, that we did. Um, it was how to indigenous now, yeah. and diplomacy and, and governance, but we're go giving it a twist. Um, we're, we're not, um, I, I'm, my team is going to kill me for this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, <laughs> we're, we're doing it very differently. Uh, we are bringing in youth from eight till 18 or like, yeah, we're, we're like the, 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 wow. the, the, the ceiling is very, can, can we defer a little bit, um, of, what we want to talk about, want them to, to talk about, is about experiences, like like you said, um, um, but also futures and visions. And like, like we we talked about, like this is something that that I that I was missing in the first webinar series. Like yeah, we talk about 
the how, but not the why. As in the use, like, all right, like the use are the why, like, like, yeah. like what, what they want to see. And it's up to us. And I'm still young, but I'm, I'm, I'm considered by, by a lot of people as in like part of the, the, the um, yeah, the, the, the yeah, I don't know what you call it. <laughs> um, yeah, it is, um, it's up to us to like to provide the tools, making sure that they can experience what, what they want to experience. Um, but there's, I feel that uh, we're talking in abstracts a lot at, at the UN, like the youth is, youth is the, the future, the youth want this, the youth want that. And I think COVID-19 gave us also an op opportunity to like, all right, let's get them in front of the camera and or let do this kind of style and like all right, for 10 minutes. All right, um, what is your vision for a future? And, and then let that, that, that inform what we do at the UN. Um, so, um, yeah, definitely team is going to kill me for, for do for saying this, but, um, okay. it's going to be okay because, um, <laughs> it's accountability, you know, like now we have to do it. Um, yeah, yeah cause we're, we're already planning on, on doing it as, um, so like probably like towards the end of the year or maybe early, early next year. Um, Maria, thank you so much for your time. Would love, I would love, uh, I loved talking to you. Um, uh, listen to you and yeah, hopefully either past COVID-19, of course. Um, yeah, we, we get to meet at Keats again, um, or within the UN context or with or outside of UN context or whatever, um, and have to have a, have a proper conversation, um, face to face. <laughs> no, thank you so much for, for everything. Um, and Maria and yeah, have a, have a great evening, evening. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, All right. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, thank thank you for for being being on a show.